I've had a couple questions. I appreciate them. But since I've had uh, two or three were about the same question, I'll uh, tell the whole class because you know how it is. You probably had the same question but didn't ask. So about your, because uh, it's your friendly reminder of your peer review paper, rough draft, the deadline for, to get points for that is Wednesday. Uh, that, again, that is, I w you have it reviewed by someone else in the class. And some people have asked, is, is that a hard and fast rule? I would prefer you have it reviewed by someone in the class so you can help each other. But if that's too difficult and you know you're going to get sufficient critique from someone else, that's fine. They would just need to, uh, well, either way, they need to mark up the paper digitally or a hard copy and let me know somehow. If you're in the class, you can just come up and tell me. <laughs> I could, uh, and if not, then email me, call me, something, I don't know. Have them come in some other time, I don't know, whatever. But yeah, that's uh, due Wednesday. And then your final, final paper. Now, it's a rough draft. So in my mind is, you, you've written most of it. But I'll be honest, it's a draft. That doesn't mean it has to be your awesome. <laughs> You'll get more critique if it's the more complete it is. So at least uh, do something. Then you, but your, then your final, ultimate, last time ever is on the 8th to turn it in. And fr friendly reminder to reread the instructions, the scoring rubric to see, and you can check your paper. And there's a word limit, and I'm asking you to turn it in in two formats, uh, handwritten, well, physical copy, I mean, and digitally. Email's fine. Or you can bring in a stick or something. Questions about that? All right. Uh, haven't got the uh, exam scores back yet, but, you know, because we did it Friday afternoon, so maybe they'll get on it and email me later today, or definitely probably tomorrow, based on their past record. And today we start a new section. Get to start making waves. This is our last big section. Uh, we'll have an exam on this stuff. And then we don't really have time to do a whole lot more, so I'll uh, teach you a little bit about electricity and magnetism, but it won't be as full and as complete. And then you're, we're done. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. The final is comprehensive and will include everything in the semester, including the electricity and magnetism stuff. I guess I just, uh, I think, did I say it sounded like there was another mission. Yes, there'll be, we're going to do waves at, um, as on the posted schedule. Here, I'll give you an idea. For those of you who haven't looked in a while. Exam three. Okay, so today we're starting chapter 19 on waves. And we'll, uh, if you haven't noticed, it's been about two lectures per chapter. So today and Wednesday on waves. Uh, Friday and Monday will be uh, chapter 20 on sound. Uh, then next Wednesday and Friday, uh, and it will be chapter 26, 27, and 29. You, I think you'll see when we get there, a lot of the stuff I'm introducing with waves I'm, doing the, I'm skipping to the light part because they're treated as waves most often too. And so all the concepts I'm introducing now apply to light. And so those will go quicker. And then we'll review and have a, your fourth exam, which will be the last exam before the final. So I will introduce some uh, electrostatic stuff. Well, that's right. We didn't even have time for mag magnetism. Electrostatics and current. But we won't have a separate test on just that. I'll just tack it on onto the final, what little we cover. The final does not really allow for a retake since class is over. We won't see each other at, at the end of the week, so no. After that, they want the grades in and to be done, so we 
No, you won't have a retake option for the final. That's to ultimately see, well, how, how good or bad did I do? How well did you get all this stuff? It's, it's a final. <laughs> but if you flunk the entire final, you got a zero on the final, you can still pass the class. Now, I, uh, I don't have exam three's grades in, but assuming you got perfect scores on everything from here on out, the class, class average can still be, a, what was it? A B plus. That's good at this point. So, there's still hope, right? All right, so chapter 19. So the way I see this is we've had forces and motions, and we did conservation of energy, and we had momentum, and we were colliding things, but then we got to a bunch of particles with liquids and fluids and gases, and so we dealt with pressure, <coughs> excuse me, and density, and things that flow, heat is kind of treated as like it flows, and heat transfer, and how things will increase their energy or not. Because conservation energy is still conserved, but th some things will get hotter, some things will get colder, the internal energy. Now, it's vibrations and waves, and we're going to see forces on things that make them uh, vibrate, oscillate, vacillate, whatever your favorite term is. <laughs> and to start with that, the two are... Um, a vibration is, I've often defined it like this, and this is how your uh, textbook author defines it too, nice and simple, a periodic wiggle in time, it's just wiggling back and forth, periodic means it repeats, so like this, the second hand on a clock, it goes around and around and around once every 60 seconds, right? It's periodic. It's repeat. We can, we can match it. It's wiggling. And obviously, it's varying with time. But the second hand doesn't really go anywhere. It always comes back to where it started. It's not like it's covering dis uh, traveling through space or anything. And that's the difference with a wave. A wave is a periodic wiggle in time and space. So it goes somewhere. And here's my example. I like this. I'm kind of proud of it. Let's do that one. So I have an ultraviolet uh, laser pen here, you know, $10 on Amazon.com. We can see a little bit of the violet, but it emits a lot more ultraviolet that we can't see. And I'm going to oscillate it. There. It wiggles in time, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, center it a little better, maybe a little higher. I have an ultra, uh, glow in the dark screen I bought. It was a toy. So as that settles down, wiggle. We can move space past it. Whoa. I guess it'll be cooler or even darker, won't it? Let's try it. And you get a nice sine curve. And if you uh, trans uh, go faster, you cover more space in less time, you can change how the, the wave looks like. Do it again. Ah, in my eye. All right. 
it gets a nice big wave when you're going fast like that, or you can let it go really fast, and the thing doesn't swing perfectly, and I don't move consistently. But you see it travels in space. That's going to be important since we're doing all this wave stuff for the next several chapters. To have that idea etched in your mind. So a, a sine wave, that sine curve, just think of it as a pictorial representation of a wave. It's something that's vibrating, wiggling in time, but through space. So sound is a mechanical wave, mechanical, meaning it, it needs something to vibrate, uh, the, the medium to transmit through. These are a bunch of uh, rods attached to a central, central wire. And if I cause it to vibrate, up and down, up and down. If you just look at the end piece here, it goes up and down, up and down. It's, a, it's wiggling. But you can see a wave that travels back and forth. That's the difference. So one of these is just wiggling, vibrating. It's physically not moving. This rod is not moving through and back. But a wave moves through. A wave is like this disturbance that can be transmitted. You're not transmitting matter with a, with a wave, but you can transmit energy. Because if I do this, and I'm over here, boom, it can hit my hand and impart energy. So energy travels with a wave, but the medium itself doesn't. Sound is like this. These are both mechanical because these, this needs the rods to travel through, Sound needs air to travel through, some medium. Well, I mean, when I'm talking, it's the air. It makes the air molecules vibrate. Or uh, when you go like that, sound travels through the molecules and atoms in the solid. If you clap in space, you can't hear it. Because it doesn't make anything vibrate that can go to your ears to hear. There's no air. You could go like this. And it can travel through your bones in your head. Oh, there's one. You gotta try it. Uh, I usually like like the metal grills or a rack or a cookie sheet or even a couple hangers. Something you can bang and it's gonna make noise. If you tie string onto the ends of it or somewhere, and then wrap it around your finger, can you envision this? You, know, you got one of those wire racks. And you got a string here and a string here, and you wrap it around your finger. And then stick your finger in your ear. <laughs> stick it in your ear. <laughs> so you wrap it around like this or this. And then whack it, you know, or have a friend whack it. The sound will transmit through the metal, through the strings, through your fingers, through your bones, into your ear, and make the uh, ossicles inside your head vibrate so you can hear it. One of my favorite toys they had were these, it's all in your head. They had different names. You might have seen them when you were younger. Um, you'd put a lollipop in it, but you could push the button and it'd spin the lollipop. But it also would have a radio. So it was getting radio reception and would play music, but you could barely hear it. It was a terrible radio. But it, the sound wasn't going through the air. It was going through the stick, the lollipop, your teeth, and you could hear it. So when you're, you could totally hear the music just fine because it would vibrate through the bones in your head, but nobody else would hear it, at least loudly. So I remember we made a box for an outreach program once, and we labeled it. It's all in your head, suckers. Thank you. It matters where you put the comma. It's all in your head, suckers, is what we meant. It's, it's the all in your head toy. Well, here's the suckers for it, but it's all in your head, suckers. <laughs> We got a good laugh out of that every time we set it up. So That's a mechanical wave. Light, as we already discussed, is not a mechanical wave. It does not need a medium to transmit through. It'll go through empty space. It's an oscillating electric and magnetic field. It'll propagate all on its own. 
So it's still a vibrating electric and magnetic field. The source of all sound and waves is something has to vibrate. If I make a wave in here, I made it vibrate. When I talk, it's your vocal folds. And they're going back and forth. And they're wiggling. With an instrument, you play a guitar, you pluck it. Bung, you make the string vibrate. That makes the body of the guitar vibrate. It pushes the air around and we hear it. But the source of all waves is, a, is a, something has to be vibrating. Okay. Uh, pendulums. Here's two of them. They're the same length. Whoosh, or I tried to, anyway. But they're different mass. This is a heavy brass ball, and this is a piece of rubber. So it's a lot lighter. So there's different mass, but the same length. The idea is you displace it to the side, and gravity pulls it down. Whoosh, that accelerates it. But the string exerts tension, so it speeds up. We've done pendulums before, and then it's, it's going fast, and it slows down and comes back. Gravity's always pulling it down, and the string pulls it back when it's going one way or the other. So it oscillates. There's a vibration. You can represent that with this as it goes back and forth from one side to the other, to one side to the other. And remember back to how uh, Galileo figured out? If we drop these, who will hit the ground first? Good job, Patricia. It's the same. Which one feels more force? Is that, or is that a trick question? Okay, think about this. We're reviewing. Why do they hit the ground at the same time? Because they accelerate at the same rate. So they have the same acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared, 10. Right. All right, and force is mass times acceleration. I was going to say, that's only because air resistance is negative. It is only because air resistance is negative. Yeah. They are not the same mass. This one's a lot heavier. Like nearly four times as heavy. But force is mass times acceleration. This has more mass, so it, ha it has a bigger weight. What's weight? That's the earth pulling on it. So yeah, the earth pulls on this with more force. It has to pull on it with more force if it's going to accelerate it at the same rate of this one so that they hit the ground at the same time. Heavier things are heavier for that reason. <laughs> so the acceleration's the same. That's why they hit the ground at the same time. Doesn't mean the force is the same because of Newton's second law. Well, you can uh, redirect it. It doesn't have to drop straight. So if I uh, roll them down here, What's the force that pulls them down the ramp? Gravity. But the ramp redirects it, so it's not going straight. It's not like it's getting all 10 meters per second squared. It won't go as fast. You know that. But as it rolls off the table, they still roll at the same rate. Is what I'm trying to show here. I think you saw it before I caught it. They still get accelerated at the same rate. That's what happens with a pendulum. They're being accelerated like down a ramp, in a sense. These have different mass. Should they be accelerated differently? Yeah, it's the same. Now, this one is swinging with more amplitude. It's a bigger, like that. We can even move it closer and try. Might be easier to see what I'm trying to show here. Uh, how about there? All right. All right. All right. They repeat together anyway. They end up over here. 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 So this whole reminder and review is that mass doesn't affect on pendulums. We talked about frequency before. And I, I think I mentioned period. That's the time it takes to go back and forth. With, with waves, we're going to use period. That's the time it takes. They take the same amount of time to repeat. 
the uh, so what we just saw was the temp the the period is not proportional to mass. It didn't matter. Now if we went to Jupiter and I displaced it, do you think it would swing faster or slower? What do you think? We took this to Jupiter and did the same thing. Do you think it would go faster or slower? Why? Very good. It would go faster. Gravity's more there. It's stronger. So it's going to get accelerated faster, which means it'll swing faster, go back and forth faster. So the period is, uh, is proportional to uh, gravity, the acceleration. Let's try changing the length. Let's make it shorter. What do you think? Same? Faster? Slower? Your gut says faster? Oh, do you see that one? Yeah, they're already off. Yeah, this one's going back and forth more quickly. Make it even shorter. So more obvious. Yes. So period is also proportional to length. But it's actually the end. Wait. Yeah. Where's my paper? Proportional length. Now I'll make the point. Now let's see how it changes. So what they do is the period is proportional. Let's see, if when we made the length shorter, when L got smaller, what happened to the period? Did it get smaller or larger? And this one gets confusing because it's, it's going faster, but that means the time it takes to do one cycle <laughs> is shorter. So when L got shorter, so did the period. So it's directly proportional. We got that one right. The gravity, if we made gravity stronger, we increased G, what happened to the period on Jupiter? It got smaller as well. On Jupiter, it goes, it'll go faster because it's being accelerated more strongly, which means it's going faster, but that means the period is less. It takes less time to go back and forth. So that one's inversely proportional. When the uh, gravity increases, the time it takes to s complete one cycle decreases. So that's the one that would have been like that. So it's on the bottom. Mass doesn't even come into play, so we don't need that term. And the actual formula, so you know, is 2 pi. Because that has to do with circles, cycles. There's one cycle, back and forth, once around. And then this square root term. But what this will remind us of is that that period is directly proportional to length, inversely proportional to gravity, and has nothing to do with mass for a pendulum. And you can figure out, and see next time you're at the park and you're in a swing, you want to go faster? Kind of hard to change G, but you could make it shorter. Wrap it around a few times. And you can argue with your friends that's much bigger than you are. No, no, you're going to swing at the same rate as I am, as long as we keep the swing the same length. You could compare. Yes? Uh huh. Sine and cosine are essentially the same thing. The way I've drawn it, it could be either. Sine and cosine are just in and out of phase by some degrees. Yeah, they're shifted. Yeah, if you had it on the x-axis or not, you know. One could start here, and the other starts here. Well, not the scale. Whoops. Get the idea? So they would still be the same type of wiggle through space, but where they start, whether one started out here, or if it started here, or started here. 
So on your axis, you would draw them different. That's the only difference between sine and cosine. They're just out of phase with each other. Uh, at this point, it won't matter. Yeah. Because that represents the wiggle. We could say, oh, well, we started right here. It was in that position in space when we started. Oh, next time you pull it back further or something, oh, and we started here. But it'll still can be represented by the same curve. Is it important that we know how to calculate what's in the curve? No. No, it's not important to know how to do that, but if you'd like to, I'll share with you. The square root is, is the same idea of like uh, kinetic energy, one half mv squared. If you doubled the velocity, the kinetic energy would be two squared. It'd be four times more. Where here, if you double the length, you won't get twice the period. You'll, you'll get 1.4, the square root of two will be the ratio. So it's a... It's a it's not a linear relationship, but it is a direct relationship. But yeah, I'm not asking you to do that. That's what we just did. I just call this a sine curve. It, they're just shifted in and out of phase. Okay. Yeah, if you had the sine of something and the cosine of something, they look exactly the same. One's just shifted. So it starts in a different spot. Let's describe one of those curves. We need some terminology. So there's our wave, our pictorial representation of a wave. All right, the, the posi position it uh, vibrates around we call the equilibrium position. So if it wasn't wiggling, it would just stay put right down the middle. So like with this guy, the pendulum, back and forth, right here is the equilibrium position. It oscillates about that point. It goes one way and then the other. One way and then the other. We call the distance, it's displaced, from that e equilibrium position, the amplitude. And that's the same on both sides. This is also the amplitude. So with sound, when I talk, this wave that's traveling to you and you hear it, that's associated with volume. It's how loud it is for, for sound waves. So if I talk like this now, the amplitude will be larger. I haven't changed what the wave, the shape of the wave, but it, the bumps are taller. It would look like this. The amplitude would have increased. What did not change was the wavelength and the frequency. And a wavelength is the distance that it covers in one complete cycle. And there's several ways to look at that. So before I draw that on, we often call the bumps that go up crests. That's a crest. This is a crest. This is a trough. And this is a trough. And so those are more of the technical terms. I often like calling them just bumps. But yeah, crests is just to differentiate the two sides. So one way to look at wavelength is the distance from one crest to another crest. If you start here, by the time you complete one cycle and get back to this position, you're here at another crest. That distance is called a wavelength. The distance you traveled in space the wave traveled in space. Notice that's the same distance, though, as from a trough to a trough. That's a wavelength also. And this is the symbol we use for wavelength. It's the Greek letter lambda. Lambda is usually for a wavelength. 
In WebAssign, it doesn't like that, so I might use W, but I tell you, for wavelength. But that could be anywhere. What if you started here? By the time you get back to there, let's see. You go down and back. Don't be tempted. This isn't the same because this one came at it from this side. This one's coming at it from this side. We haven't completed one cycle until we get back to here. That's a wavelength also. Why is sound represented in this uh, Sounds represented like this because it's a lot easier to draw than what it really looks like, which I have an animation I'll pull up in a moment. Because, yeah, the, the uh, air is going in and out like this. But they still vibrate. They just they displace a certain amount away and then come back, and so it's easier to draw most waves with a sine curve. It got displaced a certain amount one direction and then the other direction. It's still going about an equilibrium position. If if uh, it vibrated at the same rate with the same wavelengths, but increased the amplitude, it would just go further in and out instead of. And so, it's just easier to draw. I will show those. The top is being crest and the bottom is being... Yep, crest, trough, trough. The GH is like an F, like a trough if you dig a, tr a trough, because it's a, like a hole in the ground. That's how I think they, how they got the name. Now, we had frequency before. It's the same thing. Frequency F. That's the rate that it oscillates. And these two are related, frequency and period. That is this one you definitely want to remember. For example, the time it takes for a second hand to go around once is 60 seconds. So we would say the period is 60 seconds. What's the frequency then? What's the rate it takes to go around once? Yeah, it's 1 over the period. Well, the period was 60, so it's 1 over 60 seconds. It's an inverse second. In other words, it's like one cycle takes 60 seconds. You can think of frequency as cycles per second. That has a name. We introduced 1 60th hertz. Whoops. So the frequency is 1 60th hertz. Because it, take, it takes 60 seconds to go around once. Yes. Yes, yes, we're getting there, and I'll give it to you now. This is the relationship, and this is your other friend for our waves. The wave speed, that's velocity. The wave velocity is the frequency times the wavelength. This is... It looks new, but it's not. This is what we had at the beginning of the semester. Remember, distance is velocity times time. Or maybe you remembered velocity is a change in distance with time. All right. What's our distance? Wavelength. How long does it take to travel one wavelength? That's the period. The period is how long it takes to complete one of those cycles to travel that distance. So the time is a period. So velocity is distance over time, wavelength over period. What's 1 over the period? Frequency. So we just replace the 1 over the period here. Wavelength times frequency, and you get this. So it's the same thing. So this really is just telling us the wave speed. The distance it traveled 
divided by the time, or in this case, multiplied by the frequency, now that we have that term. So with that wave up there, when it got louder, the amplitude increased. Here's this example. Here's a small amplitude. But it, let's see. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006. What's the period? Two seconds. What's the frequency? It takes two seconds to go back and forth once. So the frequency is a half a hertz. It's, it's the inverse of the period, one over two seconds. You with me? Now, let's increase the amplitude. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006. The frequency didn't change. Neither did the period, because they go hand in hand. That's true with... Uh, never mind. Okay, we got that, we got that, we got that. We got that, we got that. Let's show some animations. Hope you visualize this as we go through with types of waves. All right, here's a mass on a spring. It's in its equilibrium position, because that's where it wants to be at rest. If I displace it, I exert a force on it, pull it down. I'm going to let go of it, and the spring, I've stored energy in the spring, so it's going to compress. And it goes back and forth. But over time, it's in a different spot with time. So that can be represented with a sine wave. You can see, I guess technically this would be a negative cosine wave because we started displaced here, not at zero, and on the negative side. But the shape is the same. So in my mind, I don't care if you call it a sine or a cosine. That general shape's the same. It just deflects over here a certain amplitude away from the equilibrium position. And then the same on the other side. You can see the period. That's the time it took to travel one wavelength. What's the period? It gives you the answer, but what is it? Let's see, maybe it's a little small. Yeah, let's see, from this crest, it was one second. By the time we go, there's one second, and there's another second. So it took two seconds. So the period's two. The frequency is? A half, a half a hertz. Good. Now, if we displace it not as far, it still makes a sine wave. And what's the period now? It's still two seconds for this one. With a spring, uh, we can change the mass. I'll do that real fast. Let's put this mass on here. Here's the equilibrium, it's happy. Displace it, you see, it just goes back and forth. You get an idea of the frequency, how quickly it's going. This one, mass does matter. If I increase the mass, this now has more inertia. And so the spring's trying to pull it. Here's the equilibrium, displace it, it still oscillates. But do you see it's going more slowly? That's because the spring is exerting a force on it, but we have more mass. And so it's resisting that change, and it's not going as fast. So this one goes more slowly. But remember, with gravity, it accelerates everything at the same rate. So it pulls harder on more massive pendulum bobs than the other. So it, mass didn't matter for a pendulum, but it does matter for a mass on a spring. Yes, 
there, it matters. The molecules sound is traveling through, the wave is trying to make those particles vibrate. If they resist, for whatever reason, more mass, more energy, hot and cold differences, will affect the speed and the frequencies that it can travel in that material because it's resisting or not. Excellent observation. Um, here is a transverse wave. It's a lot like this uh, wave machine over here. Transverse, transverse. That's where the vibration, in this case, is vertical. I make it vibrate up and down. Whoosh. But the wave goes horizontal. They're perpendicular to each other, or transverse to each other. That's a transverse wave, like the one showing right now. The individual coils are moving up and down, but the wave looks like it's going side to side. This allows us to have a different view. So if you take a slinky and shake it up and down, that's a transverse wave. Light is a transverse wave. It's vibrating up and down, the, or the electric and magnetic fields are vibrating, but it propagates the wave perpendicular to that direction, or transverse. Another example of transverse is doing the wave at a sporting event. You know, I could get you to all do it, but I'll spare you. You know, if you guys all stood up, and then you stood up, and stood up, the wave would travel across the crowd, right? But individually, you're just going up and down. Again, the, the, the medium, you, does not transport in space. But the wave and energy can. So that, that's another example of a transverse wave. What's another one? Um, water waves. Ripples in a, in a pond. You throw the rock in. Boop. Or you're fishing with your bobber, right? Boop. And it makes ripples. And the, the waves and the ripples seem to go out. But the water itself is just going up and down. Have you ever had your bobber in the water and you throw a rock in because your brother came with you and he's disturbing the fish? Okay, you can't relate. <laughs> anyway, the ripples will go out from the rock and that wave will travel past the bobber. And what will you see the bobber do? Or you in your boat, right? When another boat goes by, you go, whoa. You don't go with the wave. You just go up and down. And it takes the same amount of time for you to go up and down as it does for the wave to pass by you from one crest to the next crest, right? So the time it takes for you to go up and down is related to the period of the wave going past you. So that's transverse. This is longitudinal. This is like vibrating the slinky in and out. Sound is a longitudinal wave. Let's uh, show you with my the real slinky. So the vibration is side to side, but so is the wave. Can you see the little compression traveling back and forth or across? And if I vibrate faster, Yeah, you know, we can do in, out, in, out, in, out. You can see that it gets compressed. It's an area of compression and an area then of rare fraction. Fancy English term, I don't know. Rare fraction. It just means they spread back apart. Compress, apart, compress, apart. And you can get an idea of the size of the wave from a compression to an expansion, separation. That's like from a crest to a trough. No, it comes hidden. This is sound. Sound travels like this. Yeah. If I go faster, the frequency will increase, and you'll see what happens to the wavelength. Can you see the areas of compression? But they're closer together. The wavelength is decreased. And it's just a lot easier to draw a transverse wave to represent this than trying to draw what I have up here. Let me let's go back to it. Light is a transverse wave, and sound is a longitudinal. Light is a tr transverse wave. Sound is a longitudinal. Looks like let's do the uh, oblique view on this guy. 
You can just see it going back and forth. This one again, we can highlight a coil. You can see the red coil in there. That's the red coil just goes back and forth, back and forth. Doesn't cover any net uh, distance. But the wave seems to travel across the whole slinky. They're in the same direction, that's longitudinal. The vibration and the wave. So the molecules are the same thing. Well, they move just like this moves, this moves. But they always, they're repeating. They're just like a wiggle or a vibration. They're not ultimately going anywhere. But the, just like this goes up and down only. This only goes up and down, up and down. But the wave seems to travel and go somewhere. That red coil doesn't go anywhere ultimately, but the wave does. Oh, stereo versus mono. Stereo is it comes through the right and left speaker and it can be a different uh, output on each. Where mono is the same thing is sent to both sides and you hear the exact same thing coming out of both speakers. Stereo, you can record in stereo and have something different coming out of... Like I was, I, I, I'm in the Barbershop Harmony Society. I love barbershop sound. And in quartets, often they'll record two of them. Well, there's four. Two of them will be louder in, like, say, the right side than the other two who will be louder in the left side to make it sound like you're hearing a quartet. That would be stereo. But they're, all, but they're both sound waves. Okay. Another example of longitudinal is uh, pressure waves. Pressure. If you think about it, it should make sense because pressure compresses things, but then they spread back out. Earthquakes can uh, provide both kinds. There's a longitudinal and a transverse wave with earthquakes, and they travel differently. They will make the medium, the earth that they're going through, vibrate differently. Transverse will look like this. They'll be perpendicular to each, the wave, and longitudinal will make the stuff vibrate like this, parallel to the direction of the wave. They travel at different speeds also. We're going to get into that more. And this relationship, this is a great introduction to waves. Let's see if there's anything else I want to tell you for now before you take off. Do you have any questions? Maybe that was remedial for some of you, but we got to all be on the same wavelength as we go forward. <laughs> After this, we'll start uh, combining waves and uh, calculating some things. But that should be good, great to get you started. See you Wednesday with your rough draft.